Welcome back to Insight Review as we look back on the defining stories of the past seven days. The CIA's former director may have refuted Trump's wiretapping allegations, but when it came to this week's revelation by WikiLeaks, Michael Hayden made no such denial. The almost 9,000 documents published by the Global Whistleblowing Service constitutes the biggest CIA leak in history. And the intelligence shows how the US spy agency is now capable of hacking everything from an individual's mobile phone to a smart television. According to WikiLeaks, the CIA can hack many electronic devices. It's even managed to gain complete control of older versions of iPhones and Android devices. Once the CIA has gained control of a phone, it can snoop on chat apps like WhatsApp and Signal, despite their reputation for having robust end-to-end -end encryption. With the help of the British spy agency MI5, the CIA is accused of developing a remote access bug they called Weeping Angel. It's designed to take control of Samsung smart televisions by putting them into a fake off mode while being able to listen to conversations in the room. Let's bring in journalist and filmmaker Leia Bottomeo and the director of PR and lobbying agency PLMR, that's Ollie Lane. Who knew what your telly could do to you? <laughs> it could that's watch if you, you bought a Samsung. It can wa well, watch as well. It I didn't watch. refer to that, but maybe it can as well. Some tellies have the little webcam built in, don't You've they? You've seen the John Hurt Big Brother film, right? Uh, oh, yeah. of course, yeah. yeah. We've all seen that. Is it, it's not a really surprise, Ollie, that they... Uh, I think if we're really honest with each other, we, we know that this is the kind of thing that these sorts of agencies do, that they do snoop, they can get access. I think it still, however, kind of shakes your trust in things. You know, all our information is out there, you know, names and bank details mm. on various platforms. We put it out there. Uh, and if the CIA can get hacked, and if their hacking software and, and kit can get taken out, um, I think that's a, that, that does really shake people. But what about the principle? Nothing to hide, nothing to fear. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely have to debunk that. Yeah, because totally. it's, 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 you know, it's the idea that you, your tech, my tech, everything else, uh, individuals, everybody is either a weapon or a commercial entity. So it's not necessarily just something that's coming across from governments, but a lot of co uh, companies will also intentionally put in exploits so that... Oh, well, hang on. That's a separate conversation, yeah. isn't it? We're talking about the Government Security Agency in mm -hmm. our country, where we're broadcasting from in London and also in the United States, yeah. being able to keep their countries safe. It's a really now, embarrassing for argument. CIA. What's and their, that, therefore, their... trumps, quite literally, any other considerations. Their job um, is to keep their system safe. Yes. With this leak, they've actually made people's lives less Very safe. safe. Yes. Um, it's a huge embarrassment for them. They're meant to be completely secure. Um, well, yeah. the whole WikiLeaks dump, obviously, is yeah. hugely embarrassing to mm. them. Uh, these WhatsApp things that you know, some of us use on the phone, the great selling point of apps like that is it boasts, it actually says on the screen, this has got end-to-end -end encryption. Nobody else can read this, nobody else can overhear this call. And even that, apparently, is an idle boast now. It, it is an idle boast, um, but it's something that a lot of people within, within those communities already knew about. The fact that, they, that there was a patch that was created for Linux systems, which was geared entirely to the free and open source community, and that open, free and open source community were the ones that actually managed to fix their, back, their, their, yeah. their exploits faster. Uh, Let me ask how paranoid, paranoid or otherwise you are then. I mean, do you, on a little device like this, on this laptop, there's a webcam. Yeah. Uh, it's not activated. It's got a light when it's supposed to be switched on. Apparently, they can activate it without turning the light on. Do you cover it up? I cover it up, yeah. Like Mark Zuckerberg I've does. always covered it up, because I, I always know that you, I can you know, if, if, if somebody who's doing my IT can tap into my computer remotely with my permission, yes. somebody can do that without my permission. OK, next week, voters in the Netherlands will choose the country's next prime minister. It's the first of two key elections taking place in Europe, with the French to vote on their country's next president in April. And all eyes are on the far-right parties, who've gained significant ground in the wake of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump. So let's give you a flavour of the polls. In Netherlands, the far-right candidate, Gerd Wilders' Party for Freedom, the PVV, which is on 15%, is only just behind the current Prime Minister, Mark Roots, People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, shown here on the top left on 16%. And if we check the latest opinion polls from France, the far-right's Marine Le Pen is ahead in the first round on 26%, nudging just ahead of the centrist candidate, Emmanuel Macron, who's on 25%. However, if we look at the predictions for the second round of the French election, the polls show Le Pen significantly behind the centrist, Emmanuel Macron. 
So, will the polls get it right this time? Leah and Ollie are with us in the studio. The pollsters need to get it right this time, don't they? they after do. being they've so a, spectacularly yeah. wrong. They've had a bad trot, haven't they? Um, yeah. I, I think this is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, the EU referendum. Uh, Trump, and Clinton, Trump and Clinton were two horse races. Uh, France, Netherlands, different systems, just not a binary choice. No. And I think um, although uh, Le Pen for the first round, although Macron may be edging ahead possibly in the first round, and also Wilders in, in the Netherlands, whether they can actually, in Le Pen's case, get to the second round and win that, whether Wilders, even if he gets enough, um, gets the majority, whether he can actually form a coalition, I think those are massive question marks. So I think on this case, both are unlikely to get in. Um, um, it's a question of this so-called alternative right in a way, isn't it? Because it was alternative politicians mm. that maybe pushed Brexit um, mm -hmm. and helped make that happen. And mm. it, <laughs> I think Mr Trump is accepted to be an alternative politician, but of the right. Uh, do you think yeah. the alt-right continues to succeed in Europe? The alt-right in terms of, of the agenda that it's pushing forth, um, ideologically, Perhaps, or perhaps we're making too much of a meal for it, okay. and then in this Isn't case, Isn't Wilders a fairly alt-right kind of guy? He's kind of alt-right, but he's been around for a while. Sure. I mean, he's been around. He's been dismissed many, many times before. Yeah. Um, but what is it about the world now? What is it about you know the, the global atmosphere that now makes him you know the likes of Zhirinovsky, um, the likes of Le Pen suddenly the flavor of the month, and all the, all the scary things that are going on in Poland? Uh, you know, why why are they suddenly riding on this 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 tailwind of Brexit and Donald Trump. And so we have to kind of pull back and look societally as to what that's going to do. Um, what may swing it might actually be fiscal things, might actually be the stock market, might actually be sort of a devaluation of, you know, in, in, um, in real terms, the, in the economics in France and the economics in the Netherlands. Um, you know, are people that secure or insecure enough? Uh, do you to vote with their wallets. Do you think the, the, the narrative, Ollie, that there was a disconnect between regular people, you know, a great body of society, maybe lower to middle earners, who felt disconnected from their politicians or fed up that they just weren't being listened to? And that seems to have happened in the Brexit case. It seems to have happened in the Trump case. Does that apply, do you think, to Netherlands and France? Yeah, I think it probably does. I think that must uh, uh, underpin most of what's going on there. And I think, actually, whatever happens in, in France uh, and Holland in these elections, more centrist candidates are actually having to toughen up their line on immigration mm -hmm. to try and capture some of those votes. So even if they don't get in, there's been a big effect actually on policy that for the future. Well, let's stay in France, shall we, for our final and rather sad story about a white rhino that was shot and killed by intruders at a zoo in France. In what's believed to be the first such incident in Europe, four-year-old Vince was found in his enclosure at a zoo just outside Paris on Tuesday morning. According to French police, one of his horns had been hacked off with a chainsaw. Well, Leah and Ollie are with us. The trouble is, the uh, horn is so valuable, isn't it? Tens of thousands of dollars if you can get it out of the country into a black market somewhere. Yeah, hugely valuable uh, and uh, precisely zero medicinal benefit. Um, uh, and yet these things happen and, uh, in the wild and um, to bring it into uh, to happen in a zoo in Paris actually really suggests a real escalation on this of this trafficking actually which is scary there was a lot of security at that zoo yeah. um, and and yet it's not as if the zoo hadn't thought about this well or... no it also seemed that they you know they 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 kind of interrupted them because the other half of the horn yes it was, was part kind of severed, semi severed yeah. yeah and yeah. you know it's it's thinking like, thinking about the distress to the animal Thinking about the idea of, you know, when we're talking about things like security, national security, public spaces, soft targets, and all of those things, you know, if you can get a bunch of poachers in with chainsaws into a zoo, what else can you get in? Yeah. Uh, and you're also thinking about the sort of the, the, the bigger and global thing about this is, why are we still doing this? Why is this still a thing? You know, why is ivory still a thing? Why are conflict diamonds still a thing? Why is the black market still something that you know, is something that people will, will definitely go for. Well, that supply chain, surely the intelligence yeah. agencies must know something about it. I mean, it's not just down to the... Uh, we assume it's a bunch of guys who did it in the zoo, but they will have got rid of that, presumably mm. sold it on pretty quickly. Yeah, maybe, bought, maybe done it to order or, as well. Yeah. Indeed. Um, I think there's a question here for, for zoos as well. I mean, you know, their sort of point is to... Uh, a lot of education about conservation um, and also to ensure that really endangered species do continue to exist. Um, 
But if they're not keeping them safe, mm -hmm. they don't do a huge amount for conversation, conservation directly, then that does actually raise a question mark against what they're there for. And I think you know, there is a sort of reputation management issue for them. They need to be stressing the reassurance of their security, and they also need to be stressing actually they do a lot, do do a lot yeah. for, for conservation. Good to have you with us. Ollie, Leah, thank you both very much indeed. We're going to end our programme with the Insight Bite. This is just a little something that we feel you should know. And we featured the death of some parts of Australia's Great Barrier Reef on a recent edition of Insight. So an alarming follow-up to that report. The news that's come in that the bleaching effect has now occurred for two summers in a row. This has never happened before. Helicopter pictures revealed kilometre after kilometre of white coral. No sea life left to be seen. Now, scientists say the death of some parts of the coral is a direct result of rising sea temperatures, and they've called on governments worldwide to do more to counter global warming. And that's all from me for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Insight Review.